Welcome to this conversation on Gandhi and Christianity. My name is Rahel Patel, and I'm honored to have Jacob Cherian uh, with us here today from India. So Jacob, tell us a little about what you do in India. I'm based in Bangalore, which is the south of India. And one of the projects that I'm involved with is called the GEM project, or the God in the Eastern Mind project which primarily looks into understanding Hinduism as a Christian. How do we better understand another religion, especially an Eastern religion with a completely different history and civilization? Uh, how do Hindus look at God? How do they understand the world? How do they understand salvation? And one of my tasks is to look into some of these important concepts and to see in what best way we can engage with them and articulate. It's fascinating. So in these sessions, we will be looking at Gandhi and Christianity. And I believe you're doing a master's on that right. right now. Yeah. Can you mm -hmm. tell us a little about that? Yeah, um, Gandhi has been a figure that has uh, fascinated the world uh, in a sense. And I felt it was particularly important to study him as a Christian, uh, as a person who being rooted in Eastern background and Eastern philosophy, have engaged with Christianity and the teachings of Jesus Christ. So it gives us into a, a, a look into the mind of an Easterner in his earnest pursuit to understand Christianity. And are you also saying that how he would then read the Bible or how he would see scripture and Jesus' teachings and maybe could highlight some things that a Western theologian wouldn't pick up? Yep. Exactly. So how is this dialogue between us going to help our viewers uh, at home or wherever they are seated? I think firstly, it uh, gives us uh, an insight into how a Hindu, uh, how an Easterner steeped in the Eastern faith traditions would uh, perceive Christianity, would mm -hmm. understand Christianity, would grasp the person of Jesus Christ, would read scripture. I feel in that sense, uh, Gandhi kind of exposes that because he's written a lot. His, uh, his writings go into hundreds of volumes. So he's written a lot about his experiences with Christianity. Secondly, um, I think Gandhi is a world-renowned figure. And so he is a great conversation starter by himself you know, to right. understand him and to understand his dynamics between the East and the West is a conversation starter by itself. And so understanding him gives us a lot of those insights. Well, thank you, that's really helpful. Mahatma Gandhi, often referred to as the father of the Indian nation, was a towering figure in the 20th century whose philosophy of nonviolence and principles of truth and justice continue to resonate globally. His beliefs and practices profoundly affected the course of history, inspiring numerous movements and individuals striving for freedom, equality, and social change. Gandhi's influence extended far beyond India's borders. His philosophy of nonviolence, otherwise known as Satyagraha, became a guiding principle for civil rights movements across the globe from Martin Luther King Jr.'s struggle for racial equality in the United States, to Nelson Mandela's fight against apartheid in South Africa. Indeed, a statue of Gandhi acknowledging this influence now stands amongst notable British prime ministers and influential historical figures outside of the UK's Houses of Parliament. When asked about the statue, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi replied, the British are wise enough to recognize his greatness. Indians are generous enough to share him. We are both fortunate enough to have been touched by his life and mission. Gandhi's teachings on peaceful resistance and moral courage left an indelible mark on leaders and activists worldwide. However, to truly comprehend Gandhi's multifaceted worldview, it is crucial to explore the role Christianity played in his life. Despite being a devout Hindu, Gandhi's encounters with Christianity and his appreciation of Jesus Christ's teachings deeply impacted his philosophy and political approach. He found resonance in the Sermon on the Mount, drawing inspiration from the Christian concepts of love, forgiveness, and turning the other cheek. His interactions with Christian missionaries, theologians, and fellow believers influenced his understanding of Christianity 
and its potential for promoting social justice. These conversations that we will have here will help both Christians and Hindus to dialogue, as Jacob has just said, as Gandhi is probably one of the greatest social reformers and political leaders of all time. Bear in mind that some Hindus who have the political Hindutva ideology, which means that India should be declared as a Hindu nation and not secular pluralistic, do not like Gandhi. But overall, Gandhi is a great bridge to use in conversation. So on that, Jacob, can you just highlight, because uh, a couple of years ago, a scholar in Australia, uh, a Christian theologian, emailed me and he said, Rahel, I quoted Gandhi in my lecture today and some of the Indians, in fact, all of the Indians were really upset with me afterwards. So could you just share some insight as to why he's also a controversial figure uh, amongst Hindus and Indians? Yeah, I think Mahatma Gandhi is a complex figure and you can't peg him into any particular category. I guess one way to understand the um, hatred or the resistance towards him, particularly from the far right, uh, can be traced in history during the independence movement and then the later part of the independence movement. One of the things that the far right or the Hindutva movement uh, with the people within the Hindutva ideology mm -hmm. felt was that Mahatma Gandhi was moving India towards a more feminine role of nurturing and caring and his ideas of sacrifice and love. Um, they felt if India were to move in that direction, India would not have a place in the modern world. The modern world had to be strong, uh, it had to be masculine, uh, it had to show that type of grit and masculinity and Gandhi wasn't a figure who would kind of embody that. And so what you see particularly in the rise of the Hindutva movement and within that ideology is that strong masculine nature which has emerged from Hinduism. So in that sense Gandhi is an antithesis to Hinduism. He was also very one can say lenient towards Muslims yeah. Yeah. in India. And there yeah. was a period um, before the First World War where he felt that India should be a caliphate. Yes, right. It's only after the First World War when the Ottoman Empire collapsed that that whole idea got ambushed. But there are some strange writings and sayings of Gandhi. That's right. Uh, when certain Hindu scholars or writers were assassinated by Muslims, yeah. he would say something like, I embrace this individual as That's a brother, right. That's right. which upset a lot of Hindus That's that right. this Muslim yeah. assassin is not above the law. Yeah. So his... I guess they felt Gandhi was too idealistic in his ideas of forgiveness, embrace and sacrifice and not practical, uh, not looking at the um, experiences of the Hindus and what they've gone through. Yeah, because so. Indian Hindus have a different history with Islam that's right. than the West has with, with, with Islam somewhat. That's right. And that's still in India quite a hot topic. Yeah, yeah. It comes up in uh, political debates and discussions and obviously even in religious settings. So it's good to be careful, but it's still a yeah. great bridge builder. So in this first conversation, we're going to look at the Christians primarily who influenced Gandhi. So... My first question is, can you describe notable instances or examples of Gandhi's interactions with Christian individuals and communities that had a significant impact on his thinking and his practices? Yeah, Gandhi had encountered a number of Christians throughout his life. I mean, he was educated in London and then he went to South Africa and then even in India, India was under the British Empire. So he had a number of experiences with Christians all through his life. But I want to name at least three very prominent Christian influences in his life. I think the first would be a person called C.F. Andrews. And C.F. Andrews was an Anglican priest born in Newcastle. And C.F. Andrews comes to South Africa. He was sent by the Indian National Congress. He was working as a chaplain in India. And he was sent to South Africa to bring Gandhi back into India and to kind of uh, re-energize the Indian National Congress to do what he did in South Africa back in India. Can you uh, shed some light on why they wanted Gandhi back in India. What was so significant about his work in South Africa that led him to go back to India? 
Well, Gandhi started his uh, non-violent resistance in South Africa. So basically, if you look at the trajectory of Gandhi's life, he comes into London uh, to study law as most, uh, you know, uh, upper, upper middle class uh, Indians would do. You know, it has great prospects. So he comes to London uh, to study law and then after that he goes back into India to practice law but he doesn't get a job there or he's unable to find one there um, and he gets an offer from an Indian in South Africa so there were there were quite a few Indians in yeah. South Africa and some of them very well to do and so they wanted a lawyer back in South Africa to kind of represent their business so then Gandhi goes to South Africa and there he sees the harsh conditions that Indians have to go through. You know, uh, there was what he termed as a black act where Indians had to carry some sort of identification. Uh, the Hindu Marriage Act was abolished and only Christian Marriage Act was accepted, uh, which meant that they were not legally married there. So there were certain things that he found as injustices and he revolted against that non-violently. Mm -hmm. And so he did, he started his non-violent resistance and disobedience obedience campaign first in South Africa and it impacted the British. The British repealed a law uh, which in one sense they had never done in the other colonial states because of a pushback like mm -hmm. this. And so the Indian National Congress uh, which was there in India which was a group of elite lawyers took notice of that. Who wanted independence. Who wanted independence right. or at least at that point in time home rule. You yeah. know, they weren't thinking as far as complete independence. Yeah, rule, yeah. yeah, And they saw that Gandhi was doing something spectacular. If the British had to pull back on a law that they implemented, that there was something that was going on. So how on. was Andrews influential at this moment in Gandhi's life? Uh, C.F. Andrews was an interesting figure because um, Gandhi himself calls Andrews a faithful disciple of Christ. And C.F. Andrews felt to be a disciple of Christ is to help the Indians in their independence cause or to help them self-rule or self-govern and he felt that as his strong Christian calling but very steeped in Anglicanism mm -hmm. all right very steeped in the Anglican church faithful to the Anglican church but he felt that his calling is to kind of balance these two worlds and so he found favor with the Indian National Congress mm -hmm. and so they sent him to convince Gandhi and so to go back to to, to, to come back to it's India. It's so interesting, it's similar to G.K. Chesterton, who didn't want um, empire to be, you know, the British ruling over different nations. So even as a devout Christian, as a yeah. Catholic, yeah. he saw that, you know, he said once, um, paraphrase, you know, I don't want to live in a country where the sun never sets. Right. Um, <laughs> because there was a saying that the sun never sets in the British Empire. That's right. So Andrews brings um, Gandhi back to India. India. And how... After some time, he tries to convince him and okay. then after some time, after a particular few years, Gandhi felt that his time in South Africa has come to an end and then he comes back to India. But they form a very strong friendship. C.F. Andrews and Gandhi yeah. form a very strong friendship. And C.F. Andrews's life, his discipline, uh, his devout uh, love for Christ and the way in which he radiated the philosophy of Christ or the teachings of Christ through his life, that deeply impacted Mark because Gandhi. Gandhi was someone, I remember you saying, who looked at the practical aspects of the Christian faith. That's right. That's right. And who was actually practicing. And he was influenced by those uh, practices. Absolutely. Because Absolutely. Hinduism is an orthopraxy. That's right. Not, not an orthodoxy. That's right. So Hindus are drawn to how a Christian practices. And, Absolutely. And how the teachings manifest in their, Absolutely. In their lives. Absolutely. Even Gandhi's encounter to Christianity and his desire to read the Bible and know about Jesus Christ comes from these figures, C.F. Andrews for one. But even before that, the Quakers. The Quakers had a huge influence on Gandhi and Gandhi met the Quakers in the vegetarian society. So he he was a devout vegetarian. Where was this? This was in London. This was while he was studying? In while he was studying in London. So we're going a few years back, okay. all right, uh, where, when Gandhi was studying in London, there he joins the vegetarian society. So they come into Gandhi's circle and in his vicinity. And Gandhi was deeply taken up by the life of the Quakers, uh, by their devotion, simplistic devotion uh, to Christ, to see the light of Christ in the world and the way Christ manifests himself, the way God manifests himself in the world. And particularly when you look at the history of the Quakers, and you look at William Penn and his establishment of Pennsylvania, uh, William Penn 
founded Pennsylvania as a holy experiment, the way to bring God's kingdom mm. into governance, mm. into a larger political scale. Mm. I think those uh, deeply impacted Gandhi, and that's what he wanted to do later on in South Africa and in India, to be able to bring the rule of God. What would that look like on earth to bring that down? And he found that in the Quakers, in the quest of the Quakers. Another aspect of the Quakers was their passive resistance, you know, was their absolute uh, uh, resistance to violence and embracing of non-violence. So the Quakers were part of the First World War, but they never took arms, they never fought, but they were part of reconstruction programs, they're part of looking after the children in Poland and Germany and Austria and so on. So they're deeply involved in the war, but never violent. I think that was, that deeply touched Gandhi. That's really interesting because it was fortunate that Gandhi met the Quakers and Gandhi coming from a Hindu tradition that is vegetarian helped the sort of um, bridge building yeah. and, and the community because not all Hindus are vegetarian. Right. In fact, 75% of India eats meat. And it's also interesting that this was one part of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita scripture, the most popular scripture in Hinduism where Gandhi was uncomfortable with, and that was the war. Mm. You know, when Krishna, the incarnation of Vishnu, tells his disciple to go to war, and it's a righteous war, he was always uncomfortable with the violence um, yeah, yeah. in Hindu scriptures. Yeah. And it's so interesting that he was fortunate enough to meet the Quakers. Which other Christian tradition mixed yeah. with Gandhi or met with Gandhi? Another Christian tradition he encountered was Eastern Orthodox Christianity, through the famed writer Leo Tolstoy, right. who wrote uh, War and Peace and Anna Karenina, he had a correspondence with Gandhi. So Gandhi was first influenced by his writing, uh, The Kingdom of God is Within You. So Leo Tolstoy wrote a small book called The Kingdom of God is Within You, which is taken from Luke 17, 21. You know, uh, the kingdom of God does not come by low, it's here or low, it's there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So Leo Tolstoy writes about that, that Ultimately, God's kingdom needs to come into your heart. It breaks into you first. And then from there, it radiates outside. And that profoundly impacts Gandhi, that you cannot create any sort of political movement or social revolution unless you're profoundly changed from within. And when you are, that will radiate outside. So that was his encounter with Leo Tolstoy through his literature. And then he starts corresponding. Both of them starts corresponding mm. with each other through letters. And a lot of it is out in public record. Both of them very fond of each other, very respectful in the way uh, in which they write towards each other. And so he um, is deeply influenced by Leo Tolstoy such that he established a small community in South Africa and he names it Tolstoy Farm uh, because Tolstoy himself lived together in a community and his basic idea was that you don't find spirituality or the call of Christ by going up in a mountain or escaping the world. You have to live in the world. So Christ is found in the engagements of the world, in the engagement of the people around. And so that influenced Gandhi quite a bit. So it's another fortunate thing for Gandhi to come across community, which is a very deep aspect in Hindu culture. Yeah, yeah. Not individualistic, yeah. isolated lifestyles, but living together, yeah. which is still the case today in Hindu culture, even That's in right. the West, you know, families are integrated, people That's like right. to be together. And so... I mean, that, so is it in the Eastern Orthodox culture. Exactly, and, exactly. In, yeah. those part, in that part of the world, especially at that time, yeah. you know, people love community, they want to stay together, and that helps to build a bridge even today yeah. for yeah. us when we're engaging with, or just talking to our Hindu friends or family, is to, to reveal what kind of community we are. You know, how do we live together, which you just so beautifully said, which touched um, Gandhi from Tolstoy's life. Within the context of his Hindu faith, could you elaborate on Gandhi's understanding of the Bible mm. and how he interpreted its scriptures? I think a good framework to keep in mind is, and we've alluded to this in some of the other talks there, that Hinduism is an orthopraxy, whereas Christianity is an orthodoxy. You know, that is, it's very uh, scriptural based. Uh, it's, it's Christianity, Judaism, uh, Islam, mm. all of them are very text-based. Hinduism is not. And so we need to bear that in mind when 
Gandhi encounters the Bible because he's not particularly scrutinizing the text uh, or what is the world behind the text. So the way in which he encounters it is different. And so we need to keep that in mind. Secondly, Gandhi's encounter with the Bible is primarily because of the Christians that he has met in his life. Right. Christians who have shaped his life, Christians who he has been inspired to follow and seen a difference in right. their life and the way they live. Uh, that was the reason why he is encountering the Bible in the first place. So it's the personalities that shape his curiosity in reading the Bible. And Gandhi kept an extensive journal and he writes about his experiences. And he talks very clearly about his experience reading the Bible. And he says he starts with the Old Testament and he finds it really difficult to figure this yeah. out. Uh, he was abhorred by a lot of the violence that is right. there. Primarily because maybe he didn't have the context to understand or to right. put those violence in its historical context. And so Gandhi could not accept the Old Testament. So after a particular point, he skipped reading the Old Testament or reading it chronologically, and he moved to the New Testament. And there Gandhi very clearly says, the minute I start reading the Gospels, it goes straight into my heart. And it's those are his exact words. It pierced right into my heart. The teachings of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. the life of Jesus Christ, the fact that people in this world, Christians, have hailed him as their Lord and Savior, mm. the crucified Messiah, a man who died on the cross for the sins of the world. The idea of vicarious suffering, that an innocent suffering, and through that suffering, it liberates the world, it liberates sinners. That was an idea that deeply impacted him. And in one sense, it is going to encapsulate um, his mind. A lot of the things that he does, or I could say almost everything that he does, um, can be rooted to the theology of the cross and what he reads from the Bible. Also, you alluded to a little earlier, is important to note, and that is that Hindus don't read text. They go to a guru mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who interprets text for them. Yeah. Whereas Christians would read text in the Christian way. What's interesting is that the Gospels impacted him so much, as you said, it pierces his heart and it's Probably a good thing to mention that he saw Jesus as a guru. Mm, yeah, yeah. And sometimes it's helpful to say, Jesus is my guru. Because mm. yeah, that's how he would have seen Jesus yeah, yeah. as an enlightened guru. Right, absolutely. Last question for this session. What specific influence did the Sermon on the Mount have on Gandhi's philosophy and his principles of non-violence? The Sermon on the Mount had a very strong impact in Gandhi. He extensively goes back to it and he talks about the influence of the Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew 5 to 7, uh, he looks at it as not just a spiritual document, which is a document for the other world, you know, blessed are the meek, but not here in another world. He says, no, it is an actual political treatise, you know, just like Karl Marx's Das Kapital or, uh, you know, Mao Zedong's Red Book. This is the way to do politics in this world. And Gandhi uses this very strongly when he enters into India and he starts the independence movement or, and when he becomes head of the Indian National Congress, he holds on to these principles very firmly. So even when Gandhi goes on a fast, he understands that uh, even though the Indians are oppressed, they can still harness God's strength. You know, they can still hold on to God's power and be able to uh, put together a united front against the British. So he um, throws himself into it, into the understanding of the Sermon on the Mount, with the part where Jesus says, your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. So it is how do you bring God's kingdom here on earth? And even the, the passage which talks about light, as it's said in the Sermon on the Mount, it's to do things in the light. The truth does not have to hide in darkness and it needs to be brought out into the light. That even while he was revolting against the British and creating strategies, he made sure that they know exactly what his strategies were. Uh, he felt that to do things in secret and not to reveal your strategy to the enemy would be a would be to do things in the dark and truth does not have to be afraid of the light. And so in one sense, he took a lot of the aspects of the Sermon on the Mount very literally because he believed that it will win. Ultimately, the truth could win. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for that because it helps us also appreciate the Sermon on the Mount 
by understanding Gandhi's understanding because it completely goes against the caste system mm -hmm. in India, which mm -hmm. is something that he found very uncomfortable as well. Because mm -hmm. uh, the Sermon on the Mount talks about blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek. So all the oppressed, you know, uh, they are blessed in the eyes of God. Otherwise, according to karma and caste, you're just meant to be oppressed or be at the bottom end of the ladder for the rest of your life. So thank you so much. That was really, really helpful. Hey guys, it's Charlie here from The Ocker. Thank you so much for watching our video. I hope you found it really helpful in your search for truth. We couldn't do this without your help. In fact, the many people who get behind us financially, the people who pray for this work, all the people who put their efforts into making these videos. It takes about 60 hours for every masterclass video to go through the whole of the production process. So we just want to say a big thank you to everyone. If you want to get more involved, uh, subscribe to our videos or make a donation, please visit theocker.org.